I'm Dr. Lynn Patrick, and I'm here with my co-chair for EHS 2020, Dr. Jill Carnahan, one of the pioneering leaders in functional and environmental medicine. I'm so very honored and uh, pleased to have her as my co-chair this year. Welcome, Dr. Jill, first of all. Thank you, Lynn. I always delightful to talk to you. We have so many fun areas of conversation. I know. We were just, uh, just before we started, before I pushed the record button, we were trying to figure out how we were going to fit this into a five-minute conversation. But I want to give a shout out for your eloquent, concise, highly well-referenced and recent blog about cuddling up to chemicals in your bed, which I really strongly advise all the healthcare providers here listening to sign up for Dr. Jill's uh, newsletter because she does an incredible job of making very user-friendly, and I mean patient user-friendly materials, um, and also very easy ways to get educated about um, environmental exposures. Um, so Jill, do you want to just remind uh, everyone listening about how they can sign up for your newsletter? Happy with that? You got it. So basically, um, if you go to my website, which is just jillcarnahan.com, J-I-L-L, C-A-R-N-A-H-A-N.com. The very, very top line has our office address, and there's a blue button that says for practitioners. If you click on that, it'll take you right to a link to sign up. I send it out once a month, and like Lynn said, we just, I love your comments, Lynn, and it means so much coming from you, because what I've always tried to do is bring it down to a level that any person, any layperson could read and understand, like take the research, bring it down to that level, but also maintain the high level of science that you and I love so that it is if you want to look for references for the claims that i'm making in the articles they're there too great thank you so much so here we are uh leading up to environmental health symposium 2020 in april uh the theme this year which dr jill and i agreed on when we met at the ici conference in may is that we really need to talk about and create a conference around immunotoxicity. Uh, you know, we were uh, just talking about the CDC, which has released their 2019 antibiotic resistant threats report. And of course, as we all know, one of the urgent threats is Candida auris. But one of the uh, bugs on the watch list is also azole resistant aspergillus. It's aspergillus F or aspergillus fumigatus. But still, we're seeing more and more um, resistance coming up in terms of um, azole specifically with fungi and more and more drug resistance in general and one of the things that I think is just we as healthcare providers are not looking at is all the immunotoxicants in our environment and uh, attached to this little conversation Joe um, is going to be a blog I just wrote about uh, immunotoxicity in drinking water, specifically wow. atrazine, which I know you know quite a bit about, um, pers for personal yes. reasons as, well, yes. <laughs> as others, and um, another immunotoxicant in our water system, which 75% of us have detectable levels in our urine, which is triclosan. You know, triclosan yes. is that um, biocide. I don't like calling things... Um, uh, uh, ser sterilizing agents or sanitizing agents because it really doesn't I think it's not very honest about what they really do They're biocides about how these immunotoxicants are altering our microbiome and our mycobiome as well And I know Jill that you know you live in this world of seeing patients who are exposed to water damaged buildings or lived in water damaged buildings as well as patients who have complex infections of mold and uh, Lyme and uh, mycoplasma or uh, reactivation of cytomegalovirus. And I, I would like your take on how you think exposures to immunotoxicants play in here. So and the, I, that would include mycotoxins as well, because we know how immunotoxic mycotoxins are. Oh, yes. And I love this topic because I've recently just felt so clearly that the practice of functional medicine and looking at root cause of disease really truly comes down to toxic load and infectious burden. And when we're just going, whether we're shooting at each infection or whether we're, I always call it whack-a-mole when we're trying to, you know, treat these infections, it's perfectly appropriate. 
But the problem is if you have a weak immune system, you will never win the battle. And so practitioners who are focused on treating infections alone without looking at what's causing immune compromise, you're never going to get to the root cause because that immune system is the core issue. And even with our big uh, epidemic of Lyme disease and tick-borne infections, which is running rampant on many of our patients, I really believe the root issue here is not just that infection because if you think about virulence, um, Ebola is going to kill someone in three days. Lyme disease, Epstein-Barr, they're actually very low virulence, which means you have to have a weakened immune system in conjunction with these infections for them to cause massive harm. Okay. And so then we go back to strengthening the immune system. So let's break this down and make it clinically relevant. In your practice, what do you see as the kind of algorithm, uh, uh, loosely I'll use that word, uh, to start addressing immunotoxican exposure and how it's affecting immunity? Yeah, and, and to be really clear, just like you're saying with immunotoxicants, mycotoxins are a big player here, but so are chemical agents, things like organophosphates, atrazines, thalliums, parabens, um, all of the heavy metals, the, the gamut of what we talk about at EHS, all of those are contributing to the load. And what I think is exciting as clinicians is when we think about toxicity, environmental toxicity, toxicants, exposures, mycotoxins, it can feel overwhelming. And most of you listening out there are nodding your heads because it feels overwhelming. The beautiful thing is we do not have to identify every single last toxin. What we have to do is reduce load. And we know the basic principles. And some principles apply more to metals. Some principles apply more to fat-soluble toxins. But when we really focus on a patient's toxicity and focus on the principles that we know for detoxification, we don't always have to identify every single toxin because mm -hmm. they will detoxify if we give them the tools. Mm -hmm. So I always start I like, with that. I like yeah. that. I like that a lot. And I think it is the most reality-based approach that we can use. So in the blog that accompanies this conversation, um, we talk about drinking water contaminants. So, you know, atrazine is a drinking water contaminant. Triclosan, in addition to being in over 2,000 consumer-based products, I don't know why, uh, there, mm -hmm. there's a need to sterilize every single thing we use since we have a, you know, a yeah. microbiome that extends out from our skin into the air. It doesn't make sense to me. But, uh, but these are drinking water contaminants. And so filtration of drinking water, I think, really just has to become a necessary uh, educational step with our patients as we really can no longer avoid that conversation about point of use, drinking water filtration. Yeah, you know, Lynn, when I'm teaching, I always just say so simple, clean air, clean water, clean food. That is where we start. And it's so simple, people forget it. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of clean air, uh, that's something I learned from Dr. Walter Crinian, is that we are, in, we are now currently in an environment where air filtration is a necessity for most of us. You know, I live in a rural area, but I also just had a, a mold incident from, a, I had a water damage building incident, uh, from uh, leaky plumbing, and I read some of the really interesting research that Richie Shoemaker is citing, looking at using air filtration to clean up mycotoxins in the environment, that mycotoxins never go away, right? They have an indefinite half-life in the environment. And so, especially in that situation, but also because we know that uh, PM 2.5 and less is one of our major causes of um, cardiovascular disease-related death, and it's in our, you know, it's in our, in, bar, in our indoor air as well as in our outdoor air. We really have to, as healthcare providers, I know it's difficult, but take the plunge and talk to our patients about indoor air quality. Oh, huge. I couldn't agree more, Lynn. Uh, I think Walter quoted 80% of our toxic load is from air quality, not from food, not from exactly. water. Exactly. And especially when we're talking about immunotoxicants, phthalates, indoor air, brominated flame retardants, indoor air. Indoor air. <laughs> yeah, that, that we're really looking at indoor air quality is really an important part of cleaning up the immune system. Um, and then I also want to talk a little bit about metals because I think metals are mm, a conundrum for many clinicians. They don't know how to test for metals. But the big conundrum is 
do metals really have an effect on the immune system? And we're very lucky that we're going to have a researcher who's doing the actual basic research looking at the direct immunotoxic effects of mercury and arsenic. You know, arsenic is yes. a toxin. And so she's going to actually be giving us the basic bottom line about um, how mercury and arsenic affect the human immune system. And I think that, again, most common source of arsenic is drinking water contamination, the exposures that our patients have through air, water, and food. And speaking of food, and I know this is one of your favorite topics, glyphosate appears to be immunotoxic. Do you want to shed some light on that? Sure. So, you know, the... Uh, you know, when they tested this, they tested against human cells and they said, oh, this non-toxic. But the toxicity occurs on a microbiome because this is a mineral chelator originally. And so it chelates the minerals out and starves the good bacteria like lactobacillus and bifidobacter. And it allows other bacteria to proliferate like clostridia and some of the other harmful species. And in animal studies, they, they see epidemics of, of a pig version of a gastritis where they bleed out when they get excessive exposure to the mm -hmm. feed from glyphosate, and the cows have a version of C. diff colitis, which of course is becoming epidemic in humans. So the effect of this is a mineral chelator that actually binds up our minerals so that we don't have access to them. And by binding them, it starves some of our microbiome and causes pretty severe dysbiosis. And to me, it's the perfect study on why the microbiome, a healthy microbiome is so critical to overall health and immune function because glyphosate primarily acts on our microbiome and it's detoxified in many ways through a healthy microbiome, you know, spore probiotics, some of the, um, there's a few German homeopathics that work and things like humic and fulvic acid can be incredibly helpful, mm -hmm. but it's not a direct cell toxin. So it's deceptive in how, how it performs and how badly it affects our bodies. So for in your work with patients, how do you address the glyphosate issue? How do you address the problem? Yes. So yes, this is one of those just like clean air, clean water, clean food avoidance is by far the best. I think I shared many times in my own history several years ago when I tested my own and I've been eating 100% organic diet and I had levels three times that of the farmers in the French application study where they were tested on application day. Mm -hmm. That shocked me. But what it did, it did is it caused me to look at other sources like the you know grounds on my condo association where they were spraying and the dogs that walk on the grounds and sleep in my bed. So I think we have to be uh, aware, taking off shoes at the door, you know, making sure our dogs aren't tracking things into the house environment. Um, I've heard the study on organic wines having trace glyphosate. So I do think it's very, very prevalent yes, um, you'll be, in, in you'll our food. Be happy, you will be happy to know, or maybe you won't, but you'll be, there is now a certified glyphosate free wine. Um, Wonderful. I think, I think they're going to show up at EHS. Yeah. I think they're going to be doing pourings at EHS. Yeah. They're in California. Oh, wow. Very smart woman um, who has decided that she needed to produce a glyphosate free wine. So would you be willing to share about your glyphosate levels now? Have you retested? Yes, I'm retested and they're non-detectable. So um, obviously the things I've done, spore probiotics for many years now. I've done um, humic fulvic acids. I just love, mm -hmm. there's many different forms, huge fan of those. They're gentle. Yeah. They're also good for mycotoxin binding. So they're, they're another um, to do. And, um, and just a super clean diet. And, and your definition of a super clean diet is? Yeah. Um, organic, um, as local as possible, avoiding the really toxic fat soluble toxins like farm salmon or um, non-organic butter or dairy or any of those things that contain a high level of PCBs and other toxins. Mm -hmm. um, I'm grain free and I believe some of the, the, the trend towards paleo grain free diets is simply because grains are the most highly contaminated with both mold and with glyphosate. And so I think not that everyone has to be grain free, but for me, it's been a really good choice because by nature, I tend to eliminate the triggers. Um, yes. For example, the wheat in the U.S. is very, very highly contaminated, usually GMO, all kinds of things um, with the U.S. grains that are a problem. I agree. And I think, you know, I just good interview that we uh, sent out with uh, Dr. Michelle Perro, who's also, a, also our co-chair for EHS 2020 on pesticides. And she said, we just can no longer advise the environmental working group uh, clean 15 or avoiding the dirty dozen because um, it just doesn't work anymore. Um, wow. And I agree, it doesn't work anymore. I've been 
<clears throat> saying that for many years now. Well, Dr. Jill, we, we have exceeded <laughs> our five minutes, but uh, there's more to talk about. Hopefully we'll be able to do another conversation um, because we have a lot to talk about in the world of mold testing. There's a lot going on right now about mycotoxins and mold testing and their utility and how to do it. And so hopefully we can do that for our next little blog. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we hope to see you in April at the Environmental Health Symposium 2020, April 2nd through 5th in Scottsdale, where we will be doing the deep dive in all of these subjects. Thanks so much for joining me, Dr. Jill. We'll talk again soon. Thank you, Lynn.